Once again, let me bid you good morning. It is uh, great to see everyone here, great to be able to be a part of this <coughs> assembly. Uh, I'm always glad to see everybody, but I was especially delighted this morning to see Howard and Mary Lane come through the door. Uh, Howard and Mary have been uh, confined because of illness for a long, long time now, and they're doing better, and we're just so thankful for that. And great to see them, so thankful to have them back in our midst, and uh, we hope that that can, uh, can continue, that their health continues to improve. Uh, I want to call your attention to the little card that you'll find inside your order of worship that we do this about once a month, just as a reminder. Uh, if you're not yet a part of the body of Christ or a member of the Glen Allen Church, that you're wondering how to become a Christian, you're wondering how to become a part of this group, uh, believe it or not, all of that's on this card. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so we would encourage you to take this with you and read through it carefully. And uh, if you have any questions about it, please feel free to uh, raise those questions and I'd be happy to uh, try to answer any questions that you might have and help you in your, uh, your walk with God. We're continuing this morning our series of sermons on the tongue, and we'll complete that next, uh, next Sunday morning. Uh, but this morning we're talking about the, the connection between the tongue and the heart. I was interested to find out that there are 7,097 known languages on earth. That's a lot, isn't it? 7,097 known languages on earth. The Bible has been translated into only about 10% of that number. Uh, the New Testament has been translated into uh, about twice that many, a little more than twice that many. Uh, and so that's good to know, and there are organizations such as the Wycliffe Bible Translators uh, who work tirelessly uh, around the clock, year after year, to get the Bible translated into all the languages of the world. Now, you might wonder, <clears throat> why isn't 700 translations or 700 languages enough? Because most people uh, know more than one language. You know, there's an old joke about uh, what do you call a person who's trilingual or who speaks three languages? Trilingual, what do you call a person who speaks two languages? Bilingual, what do you call a person who speaks one language? An American. Uh, <clears throat> because we're one of the, the few countries in the world where most of the people don't know but one language. But in most countries, most people know more than one. They have to uh, because they are so closely rubbing shoulders with other people. Uh, we had a lady come in yesterday to uh, 12 Baskets, and um, I asked her where she was from, and she said Latvia. I don't think I'd ever met anybody from Latvia before. She's a delightful lady, and I said, so what languages do you speak other than English? And she said, well, I speak English, Latvian, Russian, and Ukrainian. Uh, so there she is speaking four different languages because she speaks the languages <coughs> of not only of her own country but of the countries that are close by. Uh, her And so we might think, uh, you know, all we need to do is get the Bible translated into the main, major languages of the world, uh, get them into English and into uh, Russian and French and Portuguese and Chinese and Korean, and, and then surely all the other people will know one of those other languages if they speak some smaller language. But it doesn't work that way. <clears throat> and the reason that it doesn't is because when you're translating the Word of God and you're trying to teach the Word of God, you want it to be in that person's heart language. That's what translators call it, the heart language. You say, well, what is the heart language? Your heart language is also sometimes called your mother tongue. It's the language your mother taught you. It's the language you first learned to speak in. That is your heart language. That's the language in which you think. Someone put it this way one time, that your heart language is the language you dream in. So whatever your heart language is, and you want God's word of all things to be in a person's heart language so they can go straight to the heart and that it can penetrate the heart because the heart is what has to be turned to God, isn't it? And once you get the heart turned, then everything else will follow. So words touch our heart, and the word that is most needed to touch our hearts is the word of God. But words not only touch our hearts. The Bible also says that our hearts are the source of our words. 
Jesus himself said that, didn't he? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You just heard read Matthew 12, verses 33 to 37. Let's look a little bit at the context of that. Why did Jesus say what he said about the connection between the tongue and the heart? Some of the Pharisees had already made up their minds. They would not believe in Jesus no matter what he did or what he said or what they saw. They were not going to believe in him. And so when they saw him cast a, a spirit that was making a man blind and mute, a demon, they cast out that, and he cast out that demon, and they actually witnessed this, the people who saw it were so amazed, and they said, could this be the son of David? In other words, maybe this is the Messiah that we've been waiting for for so long. Could this be the son of, of David? Well, the Pharisees wanted to nip that in the bud, and so they very quickly said, no, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that he's able to cast out demons. In other words, they attributed the power of God to the power of Satan. And they very quickly gave that explanation to keep people from thinking that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. Verses 25 to 29, Jesus shows how illogical that is. He says, why would Satan cast out his own agents? Why would Satan cast out Satan? The demons work for him. Why would he cast out a demon? Why would the power of Satan enable me to cast out the agents of Satan? It's ridiculous. But then also in verses 31 and 32, he says this, Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. And then in verses 33 to 37, he gives important teaching about our words, not just uh, the words of people in the first century, but my words and your words as well. He uses the analogy of a tree and a treasure. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or the tree bad and its fruit bad. And that's just the way that it works. <clears throat> Bad trees don't give good fruit. Uh, and a fruit can't be just a little bit rotten, can it? Bad trees don't produce good fruit. Good trees don't produce bad fruit. And the same way with the treasure. He says, out of the abundance of the, the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, you bring out what you have in your, your treasure. And he says, out of your, by your words, you will be justified. By your words, you will be condemned. Now, the Pharisees' words, I think you may have been an offhand remark. But Jesus warns them that it could cost them their souls. He says to them, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they utter. For by your words, you will be justified by your words you will be condemned. So what messages are there here for us today as we think about our own hearts and our own tongues? As we think about the things that we say, perhaps carelessly, perhaps offhandedly, perhaps without thinking, what did Jesus say that can help us and instruct us? Number one, make no mistake, if our words are false or destructive, the problem lies deeper than the tongue. If our words are false or destructive, the problem lies deeper than the tongue. The problem lies in the heart. Jesus says there is a direct connection between your heart and the things that you say. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's where your words come from, out of the abundance of your heart. Psalms 19 and verse 14 says, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Notice the connection. The words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart. Why does he mention those two things? Because they are, they are inseparable. They are integrally related. 
The words of your mouth flow out of your heart. So the words of your mouth uh, are simply the overflow of the meditations of your heart. And he says, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. James 1.26 says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Doesn't matter how religious you are, he says. Doesn't matter how much you go to church. Doesn't matter how much you give. Doesn't matter how many other things you do. He says, if you don't bridle your tongue, your religion is worthless. It's meaningless. It doesn't count for anything. That means if your words are mean-spirited or destructive or deceptive or slanderous, they are the real problem. They are not the real problem. The real problem is spiritual. The real problem is in the heart, and we have to come face to face with that. So before our words can be right, we have to get our hearts right. Then the tongue will follow. If your words are bitter, those bitter words come out of a bitter heart. If you want to change those words, what do you have to do? You have to change that heart. You have to change that heart. If you are prone to angry words, what do you have to do? You have to change that angry heart. If you are, are prone to words of slander or gossip, what do you have to do? You have to change that slanderous, gossipy heart. That's the problem. It lies much deeper than the tongue. It's not just what you say. Second, Jesus says, like it or not, our words reveal who and what we really are. Our words reveal who and what we really are. Jesus' images of the tree and the treasure uh, tell us uh, you can't bring out what isn't there. You can't bring out what's not there. If you've got a bad, unhealthy tree, it is not going to produce good fruit. It's simply not going to happen. If you have a treasure that's small, you can't bring out greatness from it. I would like very much to, to write each of you this morning a check for a million dollars. But I only have about half that much in the bank. So, so there's no way I can, I can write. I can't bring out of that treasure what's not there. No matter what I'm, how I might want to do it, what I might want to do. If it isn't there, it isn't there. And the same thing is, the true, about our, is true about our hearts. You can't bring out what's not there. If kindness isn't there, you can't bring out kindness. If truth isn't there, you can't bring out truth. If love isn't there, you can't bring out love. If healing and wholeness are not there, you cannot bring out healing and wholeness for other people. Whatever comes out of our mouths shows what's inside in our hearts. Someone once said, when you speak, your mind is on parade. When you speak, your mind is on parade. When you speak, like it or not, know it or not, people are seeing who and what you really are. If the eyes are the windows of our souls, then our words are the windows into our hearts. They are the windows into our attitudes. They are the windows into our thoughts. They are the windows into our feelings of who we really are. Whatever our hearts are full of determines what will flow out. We often try to deny that connection, don't we? You hear people all the time try to say, well, I, I know I say those things, but that, that's not who I really am. That's not what I'm really like. Proverbs 26, verses 18 and 19 says, Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I'm only joking. Now think about that for a minute. It's like a madman who throws firebrands. It's someone who's, who deceives his neighbor and says, Oh, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. But didn't mean it. Didn't mean what I said. How many times have we tried to back ourselves up. I didn't, I didn't mean that. I said that, but I didn't mean it. You know, you probably did. You probably did. If you said it, you probably meant it. Someone might say, I just like to pass on embarrassing bits of information about other people, but I'm not a gossip. <laughs> Proverbs 16, 28. A dishonest man spreads strife, and a whisperer separates close friends. It's perverse to do that. It is perverse and it is indicative of a perverse heart. Someone says, I know I complain and criticize the church a lot, but I'm not divisive. 
I'm not divisive. I, I just have a lot to say. Our words reveal who we really are. Someone may say, I know I say a lot of hurtful things, but I don't mean any harm by it. Do you ever have anybody come to you and say, I, I need to tell you something that somebody else said about you? I think you need to know it. Do you ever have anybody do that? I have. Every time somebody comes up and says, and it doesn't happen very often, but every time it's ever happened to me that someone's come up and said, I need to tell you what somebody said about you, I just cringe. For two reasons, because I know there's two people who are saying something ugly. One is the person who said it originally. The other is the person who wants to hurt me by repeating it. You see what's wrong with that? There's harm in that. Uh, and someone can say, I don't mean to be hurtful, but I'm going to hurt you anyway. My words aren't the real me, someone says. Jesus says they are. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Then also, Jesus teaches in these verses, there's no such thing as an in-between tree. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. That's what he says in verse 37. It's an either-or proposition. It's the same with our words. Either make them good because they flow out of a good heart, or they're going to be bad because they're coming out of a bad heart. And by the word, way, the word bad there is a word that's also translated as rotten. Rotten. And, and your words, just like fruit, can't be a little bit rotten. They either are or they're not. And so either make them good and the tree good or make the fruit bad and the tree bad. We may try to conceal what's in our hearts, but sooner or later, our words will reveal the truth. I want you to listen carefully to the words of Proverbs 26, beginning verse 23. Like the glaze covering an earthen vessel are fervent lips with an evil heart. Hear that? Like a glaze covering an earthen vessel. You can take an earthen vessel and you can put whatever glaze you want to on it and you can make it look different. You can change its looks. You can change its appearance. But it's still an earthen vessel. And he says that's the way fervent lips are coming from an evil heart. Whoever hates disguises himself with his lips and harbors deceit in his heart. When he speaks graciously, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Though his hatred be covered with deception, his wickedness will be exposed in the assembly. You know what that says? You can try to hide the wickedness in your heart. You can try to hide the hatred. You can try to hide the deception. You can try to hide the slander, but eventually it's going to come out. There's no such thing as an in-between tree. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its, tree bad, its fruit bad. Our words either build up or they tear down. And we may try to hide the intent of our hearts, but sooner or later our speech will betray us. If people listen long enough and closely enough, they'll know who we really are. You remember in Matthew 26, verse 73, when Peter was there in the courtyard of the high priest and Jesus was on trial for his life, and people kept saying, surely you're one of them. Surely you're one of his followers. Surely you're one of his disciples. And he kept denying it. Finally, one of them said, surely you are because your speech betrays you. You're a Galilean. I can tell by your accent. Peter couldn't hide who he was because of his speech. Neither can we. We cannot hide who we really are. Words are not just words. What we say matters. And Jesus says it will matter a lot at the judgment. Not just because of our words, but because of the hearts that our words betray. Thomas G. Long in a commentary on Matthew says this, Kingdom people need to speak the language of the kingdom. 
Kingdom people need to speak the language of the kingdom. What's the language of the kingdom like? The language of the kingdom is words that build up and not tear down. They are words that protect instead of destroy. They are words that offer help to others instead of harm. They are words that help draw people to Christ instead of repelling them from him. They are words that make Christ seem so appealing because of what he has done in our lives. What language do you speak? What's your heart language? What do your words say about what's inside? If it's not the language of the kingdom, there's only one thing to do, and that is to get your heart right with God and do it now. Let's stand and sing.